turn today. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. One of my favorite movies as a teenage boy was the movie The Patriot, starring Mel Gibson, and of course it's a bloody gory movie, but for a young man, what else could you hope for in a movie? You're just looking at fight scenes and you're thinking, oh, this is awesome, this is amazing. But as you watch the movie, you start to understand the reason why it's called The Patriot. And Mel Gibson is just trying to defend his family at first and then eventually gets to the point where he rises up to, to start a, a, a revolution, to start a new country, to defend this, this new land and to help build something. And the story is a good story in that sense. And I believe that many of us here are proud to be Americans. In fact, I know a number of us are veterans and have served in the military and take great pride in that fact we might consider ourselves patriots. This morning I want us to take a look at another patriot. Though he is not an American patriot, we are going to look at the prophet Jonah. Jonah is one of the Bible accounts that I remember the most from my childhood because it seemed like any vacation Bible school would, would have some sort of water theme. And of course with a water theme, one of the best stories to look at, one of the best accounts to study would be the one about Jonah because he's swallowed by a great big fish. Some of you thought I was going to say whale, didn't you? A uh, great big fish. And that is very memorable as a child to, to picture that and to imagine that in the scenes that, that are going through your mind as he's tossed out of this boat and into the sea and this fish swallows him whole. But... As I've grown up and as I've studied the book of Jonah, there's a lot of lessons that we should learn, that we should know. Here's a few of them. First off is just the universal responsibility of man toward God. Jonah was tasked to go to a different nation, not to speak and, and prophesy to the nation of Israel, but to go to the nation of Assyria, to prophesy to them. And we recognize that God wasn't just the God of the Israelites, but he was the God of all mankind. And therefore, he is the God of everyone today. Not only is there the lesson of the universal responsibility of man toward God, but just the power of preaching repentance. Jonah went to this nation that was godless, this nation that was looking at taking over Israel, and he simply went and preached this message of repentance, and we see them repent in sackcloth and ashes. There's power in preaching the message of God and preaching repentance. We also see the fact that God has authority over nature. We see that right at the beginning in chapter 1 when, when Jonah disregards God and tries to run away. What happens? God makes this great storm come upon the sea and, and the boat that Jonah is on, and he is able to command this great fish to swallow him whole. God is able to then also calm the seas after Jonah has been tossed overboard. God has authority and power over nature. Also, no matter how hard we try, we cannot escape God. No matter how far we run, no matter what country we go to, no matter what depths we dive to, no matter what planet or moon we try to, to go to, we cannot escape God. And maybe one of the more critical books, at least in regards to the lesson for us this morning, one of the more critical lessons is God is greater than country. God is greater than country. Why is it that Jonah fled from preaching to the Assyrians? He didn't flee to Tarshish because... He had any racial prejudice or religious prejudice. He showed great compassion. In fact, when you look at chapter 1, he shows great compassion for those sailors who are on the ship that are not Jews. 
They are idol worshipers, and, and they pray to their gods, and they do those things, and he didn't show any kind of contempt towards them. In fact, when you look at them in fear, and they're crying out, why is this storm upon us? Why is this happening to us? They ask Jonah, who are you? Where are you from? What, why are you here? Who is your God? And Jonah tells them exactly who he is, that he is a Hebrew, and that he believes in the God who made the sea and the dry land. And they become frightened there in verse 10 of chapter 1, and they say, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. He didn't, he didn't have a problem with them. He was fine traveling on the same ship with these people that were idol worshipers. He didn't show any kind of prejudice in that regard. Why was he fleeing? It wasn't because he was afraid. Sometimes we run away from things because we are just simply afraid. But he's actually pretty brave. He was brave enough to tell the sailors, toss me over the edge. If you really want this storm to be taken care of, if you really want it to calm down, then just, just throw me over the edge of the boat. If you, can, if you look down further into chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you. The men are not willing to do that. They... They don't want to incur any more wrath from God, and so they don't think throwing him over is the best thing to do. They, they do all they can. They continue to row. They continue to toss everything else over, but, but it didn't happen. So in verse 14, it says, They called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Jonah wasn't afraid. He had courage. He said, just toss me over. So why did he flee? Because he loved his country. Because he loved Israel. Because he believed Israel to be God's special people. And it wasn't just because of that, but because he knew who God was. Look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. This is after Jonah has preached this message of repentance and Assyria has responded. They have repented in sackcloth and ashes. And so in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, It greatly displeased Jonah. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For death is better to me than life. The Lord said, Do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. Jonah wanted Nineveh to perish because they were the enemy of Israel. He was a patriot for his people, for the nation of Israel. And he wanted to see their enemies crushed. He didn't want them to be blessed by God. He didn't want them to receive the love and compassion that God had for them. Patriotism is great to see. It's wonderful to see, and it tends to encourage us and to lift our spirits. But from Jonah, we see that patriotism and love for our own country needs to be secondary to our commitment to obey the Lord. Jonah forgot at least three things in regards to what needed to take place and in his relationship with God. Number one is, Jonah forgot that the citizenship for God's people is in heaven. It wasn't the citizenship that was in Israel that mattered. 
It was the citizenship of believing and having faith in God and having that connection to Him. No matter what earthly kingdom may claim our allegiance, our primary concern is with the matters of the kingdom of God. No matter where we live in this world, the kingdom of God is number one. That is the kingdom that Christians belong to. We had read for us just a moment ago from Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 where it says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. But it will itself endure forever. God's kingdom is the one that endures forever. It's not Rome. It's not Greece. It's not Persia. It's not Babylon. It's not Nineveh. It's not Israel. It's not even America. The nation, the kingdom that lasts forever is the kingdom of God. We need to recognize that and we need to know that. And it needs to be first in our hearts, not not America, but the kingdom of God. We should take more pride in our heavenly home than we do in our earthly one. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20, Jesus encouraged his listeners, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. Paul reminded us in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven from which, we, for which, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When John the Baptist came preaching early on in the gospel accounts, what was he saying? Repent. Why? For the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus first gets on the scene and he begins to start preaching, what does he say? Repent. For the kingdom of God is near. And he established his kingdom. And we see that establishment in Acts chapter 2. When the church comes to be. And we are a part of that kingdom because we are a part of his church. We are part of his body. Jonah didn't just forget where his citizenship was truly lying. But he also forgot that his allegiance belonged to almighty God. He forgot where his allegiance was supposed to be. He kept his allegiance with Israel, but he severed his allegiance with God. I want you to think about this for just a moment. We say a pledge here in America. Don't we? We pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, right? We make that pledge. I want you to think about that for a moment. We need to think seriously before pledging allegiance to any earthly entity. Each and every one of us that is a Christian has made a pledge. We've made a confession. And we've pledged our allegiance to Jesus, who is our King. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. When Pilate interrogated him in John chapter 18, he said, are you the king or the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, I am a king. He says, oh, so you are a king. But he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Throughout that whole context, what do we find out? That Jesus is king. And we have pledged our allegiance to him. When you're asked before you're baptized, Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? When you are asked that question, do you know what that means? It's not just a question of do you believe in Him? It's also, based on your answer, a confession that He is your God and that He is your King and you are pledging your allegiance to Him, and then you are baptized into Him in the death, burial, and resurrection according to the gospel message. We need to recognize where our allegiance truly lies. 
if our allegiance is somewhere else, if it's to America or if it's to our spouse or if it's to our children or if it's to something else other than God, we've missed the mark. That's not to say that we don't have our allegiance and that we don't have our commitments to our families and to our country and to other things. But if those become stronger or greater than our allegiance to God, then we have missed the mark. Jonah also forgot what his primary mission was. Jonah wanted to save Israel. He wanted to condemn Nineveh. He wanted to condemn Assyria. And he wanted to save Israel. But he forgot what his purpose was. His purpose was to be the mouthpiece of God. When Isaiah is asked in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, the question comes up, Who am I going to send? Who will go for us? Isaiah cries out and he says, Here am I. Send me. That's in essence who Jonah was. He was the prophet of God. He is supposed to speak what God asks him to speak, and he's not just supposed to speak it and proclaim it, but he's supposed to proclaim it to whom God tells him to. It's not just say it, but say it to whom I've told you to say it to. You're supposed to go to Nineveh, and you're supposed to proclaim this message to them. But instead, you've run away. You got on a boat, and you're going as far away as possible. Why? You're supposed to be my prophet. He forgot what his mission was. Sometimes we forget what our mission is too. We recognize that we need to have our commitment to the kingdom of God, to, our, to have our commitment to Jesus, and so often we think all that means is that I come to worship on Sunday. Or, or, I, or I help out with, with my brothers and sisters in Christ when they need something. I'll do some good deeds here and there. I can't do everything. I am, I am busy. But we're just willing to do the things that maybe we're comfortable doing. Or that others won't take offense at. And we forget that our mission is to save souls. Our mission is to be concerned about the kingdom of heaven and the decrees to save the lost. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it says that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. What did he command us to do by his example? To seek and to save the lost. We often quote from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. The fact that all authority had been given to Jesus. And that we need to go and make disciples by baptizing them and teaching them in all things. But just because we quote it, just because it's proclaimed from this pulpit this morning, just because it's said, are we going to carry it out? Jonah was told the message he was supposed to preach. Jonah was told exactly where he needed to go. Jonah knew exactly what would happen if he went and proclaimed that message. Could you imagine knowing that if you went to preach the gospel message to a group of people and you knew that they would, after hearing that message, immediately repent and turn to the Lord? Could you imagine saying, God... I can't do that. I don't want to do that. There's times when I get maybe a little anxious because I don't know what someone will think if I bring up Jesus, if I say something about the gospel or I bring up a religious, religious conversation. I can get anxious about what others might think or what they, what they might perceive or consider about me because I don't know what their answer will be. Jonah knew that God would forgive them, that God would be compassionate. He knew they would respond, 
and that they would be forgiven. And he didn't want that to happen. What about you? What about me? Are we preaching the gospel message to save souls? To save souls and to expand the kingdom of God. We are shown by example that we need to seek and to save the lost. We're commanded to go and to make disciples, to baptize them and to teach them. The fact that Jonah loved Israel is admirable. He loved God's people. However, he needed to be reminded that God loves everyone. That God does not, does not want everyone to perish. Instead, He wants everyone to be saved. Even though He knows that not everyone will be saved, that's what He desires. And He desires you and He desires me to take part in that. And if we truly care about the kingdom of God, if our allegiance is really with Him, then our desire should be the same. Our desire should be the same as God's. To make sure that everyone hears the gospel message and has the opportunity to be saved, to come to repentance, to put their allegiance in Christ. Jonah, and even we might be some great patriots for our earthly nations, but this morning, God is calling you to be His patriot. He's calling you to love and to defend His kingdom, to spread His kingdom, to stand up on behalf of His laws and His people, to not just defend, but to proclaim and expand and to save. <coughs> this morning the question is, will you become a citizen of His kingdom? Will you not just become a citizen of His kingdom, but begin to live a life Believing in His kingdom. Following its rules and statutes. Proclaiming and heralding the message of His kingdom. That He loves everyone. And he came and He died for everyone. So that they would be saved. So that they would have eternal life. If you're ready and willing to do that, the opportunity is for you to respond to the gospel message. Being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to begin to live and walk a life of righteousness. A life of obedience and faith to Jesus. Knowing that He is now your King. And you are going to follow Him until death. If you're ready and willing to make that commitment to give your allegiance to Jesus and His kingdom, please come while we stand and while we sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler,